Welcome back, fellow armchair generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Field of Glory 2, the Rise of Persia DLC campaign. Okay, looking at the battle this perspective, nice figures. At least I think so. Um, it sort of tells you a little bit about, um, you know, what a commander here. Um, would maybe see and we have here here's Cyrus so he may be seeing oh hey we've defeated all these guys hey you know our units are doing well and we're we're organized up reasonably well and then you zoom out and you go oh what happened to the left wing and um, other such things so yeah that is definitely a thing hmm well Oh, I think we'll just stay right there where we are. Let's end this turn. Oh, the cliffhanger, the cliffhanger, the cliffhanger. Yes, they disperse. We have done some good combat. Ooh, we break routing. And then, of course, we're also running away from the, the field as well. So even if we win, it's a Pyrrhic victory. Ooh, they actually did well, our troops. Oh good, they break. Very good. They didn't need to take both units with them, did they? Oh, and they held firm and they fall back. Good. Okay. Wow. Hmm. Don't know where we go from here. Okay, it looks like it's breaking, routing some of these other guys, so that was useful. That was useful. Hmm. Now, still our decision point here. Hit him in the flank. That is not our unit. Mm hmm. See if we can take down these guys, turn and shoot. I don't think we're going to readily at least defeat them. Um okay, they can't because they're sort of tied here. Um well, neither of those will seemingly do much. Um No, we don't need to shoot, I think, but it might be nice to encourage others to run away. Okay, guys, you come up here. Turn and face that way. Hmm... and face this way. Okay, so we've sort of rebuilt a line to some degree here. Um, 
Actually, I sort of would want them right there, but we'll get these guys faced that way. Yes, I do think they are probably... Well, since they can't... really go anywhere else. Let's see what riding our horses into them does. Maybe not good things, but got them fading. That probably wasn't the smartest thing, but um... Okay. I think pouring in fire is better than trying to, yeah. Mixing it up hand to hand. It looks like we might win that, so let's charge. Okay. They evade. Good. Sort of gets them off of our flank there. Um, well, that might not have been... Oh, let's charge them again. Flank attack. Okay. Well... Okay, we're trying here. Let's move these guys way over here. Maybe give these guys some courage that they have. This is... Okay, the sub-general. Eh. I don't know. That's probably better facing. Let's not forget these guys. Um, hmm. <coughs> yeah, get across this. Avoid the broken ground. There we go. Yeah, I don't know that we need to fire. We just mostly encourage those guys to continue to run away. Disperse, disperse, good. Hold firm. Disperse, very good routing. If we can get their units to disperse. I think they're dispersing more because we have horse in the area. Um, it could mean we get enough of a percentage. And win. We don't have to defeat all their units. We just have to defeat a greater percentage of their units than they do of ours. These guys are still hanging on out here. Oh good, those guys break. Now those are the weak hopolites, so yeah. No, they disperse, that isn't. Okay. Okay, well, hmm. Let's see what we can do here. We're gonna use firepower on these guys. And 
here, let's... Probably not enough, but... These guys were too wouldn't do well. Well, let's turn and shoot. Maybe we should have concentrated there, but Hit him in the flank. Impact. He didn't take anybody down, but... That did, but now they held firm. Yeah. Throw right into there. Good. Okay, encourage... These guys to run away, evade, flee, panic. Of course, that term panic is named after the god Pan. Okay, good. Not really hurting them much, but just more pinning them, disrupting them. Turning that way, it looks good. Looks like we'd win that, so let's do that disrupted. Okay, good. Just making sure that all these guys have shot. Okay, nail biting in the extreme, which means I'm not the greatest general. Battle shouldn't be nail biting, at least not, well, I don't know if these are evenly matched, but at least not well matched units. Uh-oh, they're coming back on the field of play. Finish chasing off my unit. So I don't know whether I should try to break this unit or should I concentrate on this unit or this unit was the say him. Um, okay, let's keep with the concentration here. Maybe 
maybe I should have fired forward, probably should have, oh well. Oh uh, yeah, that would have been better. Sides. See if we hit them in the flank. It's not what I want to do, but I think it's what might might help us. That is not a great desirable move, but well. Um, yeah, might as well shoot there, because we can. Okay, our patrol to push enemy off. Okay, that's good. They're, they're pursuing these guys. These guys can come over here and scare them some more. Um... Let's... Head over towards near them to scare them, maybe. Um, okay, well. Uh, um, brakes routing good. Held firm. Very good. Let's see if we can. Well, they're at least fragmented now. Um, turn and shoot or throw. Okay, that was slightly good for us. doesn't look good. Um, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to come up over here and we're going to shoot. Just sort of annoy them a little bit. Didn't even hurt, hurt anybody or no casualties. Um, come around the flank. Uh, I was really counting on breaking them this turn and having all these people run, run away in fear and panic. Okay, um, well, let's see how this does. Okay, yeah, our guys break. Yeah, I'm surprised it didn't happen sooner. right off the edge. Well, didn't quite make the edge. Yeah, that's what I feared. But, oh, well, they that didn't do so well. Okay, impacted on our troops. Great, auto brakes routing, hopefully, uh, oh, disrupted, good. Didn't take too many units with them. Good, our troops rallied, they're evading. The enemy has lost heart, you are victorious! Wow, like I say, a nail biter. I, um, oh, that is a Pyrrhic victory. As we have talked about that before, um, King Pyrrhus, 
believe it's King Pyrus, so... Okay, um... Okay, we claim this glorious victory. Don't know how glorious it is, but... At least the Persian Empire continued to rise. Let's see, they had 59% total loss. We had 23% total loss. Now, of course, we had lots of units run off with lots of people that just left the board, dispersed, you know, broke up. Didn't quite go home, but, you know, we're out of here for now. And um, we'll get them back. That's why that is... Because our army had units that ran away was higher than 23%, I would say. Um, but... Okay. Okay. In 543 BC, the Median satrap of Sog Sog Sog. Ah, it's, an, it's a name I heard. I remember it from uh, my university days. Um, Sogdia. That's how you, I think say. It. At least in the American accent, Sogdia. Who knows how they originally said it has declared independence. He has secured an alliance with the Scythians. I think that's Scythians. Um, King Cyrus has hastened to suppress the revolt, revolt, but his army has become somewhat strung out on the march, so that uh, meeting the rebel army unexpectedly, not all of the Persian units have arrived. Okay. Um, Let's see, I'm trying to remember some of the details of um, from my ancient history courses. Um, not about this, but generally about satraps. A um, few people have um, mentioned some of that stuff. As it was explained to me, they are a... Um, a satrap is both a a region and a person. So you could talk about a satrap in referring to a geographical location, or you could be talking about um, the um, the individual. Um, they are very much um, autonomously governed, I guess you would say, zones. They, the satrap, unlike, say, a, and again, th I'm sure it varied at different times during the Persian Empire and post-Persian Empire, which at times still uses the term satrap, um, I'm sure conditions and details varied. Um, and also, because I'm going to compare it to, to Rome here, um, conditions varied in Rome. It is somewhat like a, um, a, um, client kingdom within the Roman Empire. When you see these big sort of maps that sort of cover, you know, this is the extent of the Roman Empire in, in you know, given some date. Um, within that, there are all kinds of political um, uh, organizations, would be good. Um, some are provinces that send senators to to Rome and senators um, are a bit more of an appointed affair if I'm if I'm not mistaken than than anything that is popularly elected um, but I could be wrong about that and, uh, and I'm talking Roman Empire senators not senators from the Republic era now I'm talking much later um, but they were um, significant people in their region, generally speaking. Um, and so, you know, there were provinces, provinces that sent senators. And then there were provinces that were just, you know, under the control of the Roman Empire. And the ones that sent senators also have governors. But just it's a direct rule province that is maybe a bit of a problem. Um, and they sent out a Roman governor. Um, of course, the most sort of probably famous one is Pontius Pilate, um, and for the province of Judea, I guess it would be called. And uh, now, depending on when, and I think at that, now uh, maybe Herod's a bit. Herod may be able to. Ah, uh, guys, I'm not great on dates and overlapping. If there were more than one Herod, um, and sometimes, and now Herod was um, a king that in that region. But sometimes maybe a bit outside of Judea, 
again, these all get sort of um, uh, messy. And so, but within the Roman Empire, there were kings and they had kingdoms. These were client kingdoms. Sometimes they might be considered outside of the Roman Empire as people are drawing maps. Sometimes they um, might be within the Roman Empire. But when someone becomes a client kingdom, they may not realize it at the time, but they um, they can't decide to not be a client kingdom in the future. That is something that is um, Rome sort of passively, aggressively, at least mostly passively, aggressively expand. Sometimes you get like Julius Caesar marching around Gaul and conquering all kinds of places, but... And the move into Dacia, I believe, is just sort of, you know, a military expedition. A lot of times they set up and go, hey, yeah, um, you know, well, somebody will come and some king or chieftain or whatever will come. Hey, there's these bad people on the other side of these mountains that are doing bad things to us. Oh, Rome, would you come and ally with us to, to, to deal with these bad people? And the Romans would go, yeah, okay, um, you know, that's going to cost some money. And, of course, it's going to cost lives and whatnot. So you're going to have to pay us, you know. Oh, you can't afford, you know, $10 billion or $10 million or whatever, you know. Um, well, you can pay it out over us for over the next 20 years. Okay, so that's fine. Because you, you can afford, um, you know, half a billion dollars or whatever it might be. Okay, so, yeah, you can pay that out, you know, the $10 billion over 20 years. And, oh, well, you're going to be our ally so that if we're attacked, you have to... Um, send troops and actually show up, you know, I don't know whether they spelled it out, 500 troops or bring your army or how it was defined. You have to do that. And um, you have to allow like Roman trade because, you know, um, Roman merchants and whatever. So you have to do all these things. You agree? And he's got, oh, yes, yes, sir. Yes, we agree because, you know, these bad people are going to come and do bad things to us, whatever, whatever that might be, whether it means kill everybody or... Um, conquer them and be their overlords or or just maybe um replace one because sometimes it's you know there's two claimants for the chieftainship the kingship the whatever and you know the king that's wanting to stay on the throne and it may be his brother that's being supported by the other thing i'm just i'm trying you know get it away from any specific um event here and so he sees this as you know the the losing seems to be worse than the allying with Rome. And okay, and then so Rome, yeah, okay, good, sign it, great. Rome does its bit, and then maybe the king dies, maybe the king goes, hey, those legions that were sitting on our border for five years before we signed that agreement are no longer there, um, and they've now, they're, I hear they're fighting, you know, 10 million miles away or whatever it may seem like that to them at the time and they're they're embroiled in some other sort of thing and of course Rome's moved the legions either because there's other dangers out there or because since now they have a client kingdom next to them they no longer feel threatened that's also the case and of course it may be a combination of things but so Rome you know and so now it looks like Rome is not that big of a danger. <coughs> Excuse me. So Rome isn't that big of a danger. So, yeah, you know, they say, yeah, you know, that, that half a billion dollars a year. Um, yeah, that that's like hurting our treasury and all. And I wanted to buy a new Ferrari. And, you know, that, that, that pr private jet airplane looked really, really cool. And I could afford that. I don't have to pay you half a billion dollars. Oh, we'll still be your allies. Yeah, yeah, no problem about that. And yeah, okay. Um, or it might be a yeah. Um, whether it's the king or his son or the person that killed him and took over afterwards starts intriguing with some you know other similar groups of people. Celts will just call this group because it could be Persians, it could be, you know, any sort of buddy anywhere group. Yeah, you know, hey guys, if we all get together, you know, those Romans, they're off fighting those um, Seleucids, whatever they may be. We don't know, are those dragons or are those, uh, you know, type of food? We don't know. But Seleucids way off over there, 
Um, if we all band together, we're, we're going to be just golden. Mm, yeah, okay. And so it sounds really good. No, you mean I can join you and I don't have to pay them half a billion dollars a year and I could just get that jet and that my private jet and that Ferrari or you know whatever they would have equivalent thought of it then because no, it wasn't going to go to the people. Um, so yeah, 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 that's good. And so when they did something like that, um, and it seemed like eventually most of them, now maybe most of them didn't because we just, I just as a student of it, don't hear about how when everything goes smoothly, you hear about the revolts and whatnot. But it seems like a lot of these things sort of go bad at some point. And then, so then the Romans like go, oh, oh, you broke your agreement with us and come down really, really hard on them to the point of like showing up and going, yeah, 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 okay. We're going to kill everybody until you stop fighting. And then they stop fighting. And okay, everybody here is now a slave. Everybody's now a slave. Um, get into the social justice war, warrior mode here for the moment. Um, traditionally, slavery has not been based on skin color. That is a um, weird post-Christian -Christ era strange justification that they started out by capturing um, people in Africa because they weren't Christians to sort of, they weren't civilized, so civilized people could sort of justifiably capture them. No, they also did lots and lots of slavery. The Spanish um, in the um, Central and South America, but Indians didn't seem to take to slavery as well and died off where the Africans seemed to um, suffer slavery better is that some sort of genetic thing i don't know and it's it just so so they, so they decided to move slaves slaves from africa seem to work better than slaves from the americas um so that's sort of you know that's sort of a more recent idea and the justification sort of this the spanish conquistadors hooked up with the jesuits and others is that these people aren't christians and so um, good civilized Christians should take over their management, shall we say. But traditionally, slavery is um, very different. Um, and I mean traditionally in the sense that for most of human experience. Um, in China, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm not an expert on the area by any means, most of that was debt slavery and that could be inherited generation to generation so a family whether through a fault of their own or through no fault of their own would be get would be gotten into um, some sort of debt um, and so they would have to work that debt off but while working that debt off they still incurred expenses so it's sort of like on the idea on the books is yeah we're paying you five dollars an hour and it costs four dollars an hour to you know feed you house you and um clothe you and whatnot and that and so you owe x amount of money okay and you're supposed to be paying off um two dollars an hour but we're only paying you five dollars an hour um so yeah okay we'll pay off that one dollar an hour from the principal and just add that um second dollar to what you owe us you know so that was sort of debt slavery is my understanding how it it, please people this is no justification this is just an explanation of my understanding again and my understanding i'm sure is wrong in detail maybe completely wrong but i think generally right um of slavery that's sort of how it went in china and i'm also presuming here that they captured conquered peoples and whatnot and made them slaves at least for a time and so, like most slaves in Rome, and I don't have, we don't, we don't have any good stats, but I do believe most slaves in Rome come from north of Rome, shall we say? Not, I don't know if it would be called Central Europe, but it may be West Central is in north to south of Europe. So um, there was no uh, African or Sub-Saharan Africans because Africans. Because you look at um, some of the early um, Christian saints that are Africans, they're not 
black people as we think of sub-Saharan Africans there, like Carthaginians and um, Lydians and, oh, I don't know, you know, other sorts of, um, not Arabs. Arabs hadn't moved into the, the region yet, but, and they were, um, some of them dark, darker type skin. Uh, this is not a skin color, skin tone thing. This is a more genetic understanding. But, and you see in some movies like um, Cleopatra, um, sometimes that they have black African slaves. Those were very, very exotic and definitely existed to all the best of our knowledge um, in, in Rome. But those were like, ooh, wow, you have a, you know, uh, um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of a good supercar analogy. You've got a supercar of a slave here that's really sort of different and cool uh, as we just have Celts, you know, as our slaves. Um, so slavery... Um, was very much a thing and to a point this is why I well one you have to understand the world in the way it was and why I don't jump up and down and, and condemn all this is you have this group of people that has just fought you in a war and since you can just pick up a stone or a stick you know a club and bash somebody overhead there's no practical way to disarm them so e either you have to um, trust that they're not going to rebel at you or against you again and butcher your women and children and other things which they often did, um, which is a stupid thing to do. Or you have to lock up these people in prisons of some sort, camps, whatever, or you're going to have to kill them all. Or you take them as slaves because you don't, it's not like the idea of we have M1 Abrams and you have sticks and stones. You know, you better not misbehave or we're going to start sending cruise missiles in, in at you. It's it's much more of a, you know, a, a situation in which spears, daggers aren't that hard to to manufacture. Swords and armor, you know, proper armor is, but, you know, just enough to, to rebel and, and cause real death and mayhem is hard to do. So slavery, and people often look at it on an economic basis, and there it definitely is, but I would look all of you out there, and I know a lot of you spout this stuff, and I'm sure that I have is, is the moment. It's come out of Marxism, and Mark, and there's a lot of Marxist historical thought um, out there spread by people who don't believe in Marxist, you know, you know communism, but they they want to view everything through economics. War for oil. Most wars aren't fought for for that kind of stuff. It's it's over passions, it's over cultures, it's over other sorts of conflicts, sometimes over res conflict over resources, but most of the time not. Now Rome does often um, enrich itself through war as well, but that isn't, um, in my opinion, the main reason for war. So yeah, we delve deep into Rome here, but so Rome was sort of mostly passive aggressively expanding. But there were often long, long-term, multi-generational client kingdoms that I'm sure, and I don't, I'm sure different treaties and different things, you know, that they had to give up money or when called, they had to send some troops and, and whatnot. And it's just sort of the idea that um, conquering them isn't worth the trouble if you can have a compliant client king and often you, you get him and you take one of his sons back to Rome and you hold the son in Rome. And so that, yeah, if he misbehaves or he dies and the younger brother who's now king misbehaves, Rome can show up with this other dude here. So it's not the, 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 the hostage isn't necessarily a hostage. We will kill him if you um, misbehave. It's more like, we can put him on the throne. We'll show up with a couple of legions. We'll kill off your immediate supporters. And the rest of the people will be told, hey, this is king number two, you know, the son. He's now in charge. And, um, yeah. And so that there's often a, shall we say, deep and longstanding um, cultural connection with some of these people. And so long, you know, and... If you keep rebelling, we'll we'll keep doing very very bad things to you to the point of eventually um, slaughtering all of you. But um, so it's normally like, yeah, we've rebelled a couple of times, you know, not 
this month or this year, but in the last few generations, yeah, we better not do it again. And so long as it's livable under Rome, we'll take that deal. And that's sort of how it goes. And that's sort of how client kings, you know, and so they're sort of within their within their realm. And so long as they're reasonably successful in that there isn't, um, you know, local rebellions and uprisings. They're not like going, Rome, 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 I need more troops to like, like go collect taxes, you know, and I need more support. And as long as they're, they're you know, keeping a lid on things, whether they're doing a good job or bad job of being, a, you know, governing the people doesn't really matter to Rome. Just as long as they're keeping a lid on things, then, you know, Rome's all good with it. Okay. Now jump over to the satrap. A satrap, the person I'm talking about at the moment, is a person appointed by the Persian emperor. And again, we see the satraps continue under Alexander. I don't know if, I just quite honestly right now don't know if uh, people like the Seleucids, which had a very big um, empire that's a, um, initially a satrap under the Alexander's successor, his son, that sort of fades away. But um, and then it's sort of independent kingdom, whether they, because they have a pretty, pretty, at least for a while, pretty spread out empire, whether they continued the satrap policy. I think they did, but I just don't know, quite honestly. Um, so, um, and other empires may have continued to use the term, but a satrap is somebody who's appointed by the emperor. Now there, I'm using a Roman term, and I was wondering the other day, is it a shah? Is that what the Persians called them? I know that's sort of what the Iranians called them. The Iranians are sort of Persians, I know, but eh, confused. I don't know. But the 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 number one guy in in Persia, Cyrus is our current um, number one guy, King whatever King Cyrus is what it's saying here. But um, appoints a satrap, and he goes to the region. Generally speaking, he would have no connection to that region. And so he has no um, formal or informal alliances with local peoples. So he's there and um, people do what he says because the might of the um, Persian Empire will fall on you if you um, disobey me. And so he'll run his um, satrapies. But... He can be fired like that from the, the Persian emperor because he has no like local power base. And so what they'll, they normally did was is try to keep moving these guys around, shuffling them around, not letting them stay long enough to get any sort of power bases locally so that maybe, I don't know if this is the Median satrap, the person of Sognia, Sognia, or if this is just the province uh, satrap that revolts and declares its independence and throwing out the the appointed person, I don't know. But the idea is is that they're not to get they're not to have long term units that are loyal to to the satrap, you know. So he doesn't like take his personal ret well a personal you know staff, but not um, military retinue from satrap to satrap. You know he doesn't have um, the personal connection, so he is there. So long as the Persian emperor says, good, he's there, he moves when he says, move. And so it tries to keep this from happening. Now, obviously, if you mismanage your situations, you may lose your job as being satrap. Now, I don't know that that means you're killed or beheaded by the Persian emperor, you just may go back to being a, a flunky in his palace, you know, admin, administering the, the stables or something, which may be a responsible job because the stables may be um, 5,000 horses because it's not just, you know, the king and the 20 horses that he rides, but it's, you know, his um, bodyguard units and whatever else. So it may be a, a prestigious job in the um, Persian empire, uh, often jobs like that were very much and very powerful and not only made lots of money but had access and so people get bribed to like hey you know get the get cyrus to solve this problem for me or something like that um so you know it's a prestigious job but it's no longer like an independent command so it doesn't doesn't mean that you know if you don't do well um that your bad things are going to happen to you because maybe they just realize that yeah 
he was good at running the stables before, so we had him in charge of the say trap. So we're going to put him in charge of, you know, he ran the, the stables at a profit. We'll put him in charge of the treasury or something, you know, mixing up the um, the jobs. Or it could be that, hey, um, you, you were rebelling and we're going to kill you and your family. Um, you know, I'm sure that um, is also a... Um, an end result if you're seen to be not just you didn't do well and of course you could be doing well and you know we can look at the the famous history the jews were hard to rule either under herod or under pontius pilate or others um i'm using those not to spread a religious viewpoint but just that most people in most cultures know sort of the story there so you do have um other groups of people that were hard to rule um they just don't all have um books still in print about them and that everybody has heard of but so sometimes you know it's like yeah yeah okay yeah you were ruling those guys yeah we know they they they, they have a rebellion every other year just because it's every other year um you, you did okay but yeah you know or it could be hey this thing was running great when you showed up and now look at it you know um and those would of course be very different reactions to to the situation. So that sort of gives you what I understand satraps to be. Um, they were generally um, geographical locations that would be e easily sort of managed. Like we can see, presumably, let's just presume that this is sort of, and I think it sort of is, sort of a mountainous um, line here. And so this might be a satrap in along the coastline here because it's a you know a, a geographically defined easily administered re region and the other one would be sort of like up into to here kind of thing and so and would often cross uh multiple cultural boundaries because you might have greeks along the coast and whoever's living more inland at the time in asian minor and so it, you know it'd be sort of a hodgepodge of things um and that's sort of how it would be you know um and generally speaking, I think the geographical boundaries of the, of the satrap would be long-lasting. So, yeah. We must detach some units. Okay. Well, I want to thank you all for watching. Thanks for listening to me talking on, on and on. I hope it was of, of interest. Um, you can um, like the videos. That would be nice. You can make your comments, post questions, um corrections because like i'm sure i got some details wrong i don't necessarily know what it is and i may got big things wrong and if you know it um yeah it might make me look a fool but um it really does um help for the education both for me and for those of us um you know those uh, watching later on they can read it and i always recommend reading the comments below thanks so much see you next time for more historical gaming